Okay, hello, I'm, I'm Les Bennett, and representing the American Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists, and I have the pleasure of hosting the Distinguished Pharmaceutical Scientists series that the AAPS puts together to provide background information and a record of the outstanding scientists who are, serve our profession and have such a great influence. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Michael Pacal, who's now a professor at the University of Connecticut. Mike, good to have you here. Thank you very much. Pleased to be here. So let's go back a little bit and start with your history. I know you had an undergraduate degree from a small college in Minnesota, I believe, That's and right. then went yeah. to Iowa State, and then you spent a little bit of time in California. Give us that history. Well, uh, the college in Minnesota was St. John's. Uh, it, it, this is the St. John's in Minnesota, not the St. John's that's better known uh, uh, in the East, uh, and there's always some confusion on that. Uh, Iowa State in Ames, Iowa, where the uh, corn grows tall, uh, but a very good institution, uh, particularly in physical chemistry, which is what my PhD was in. And in California, I actually did a postdoc at the Lawrence, uh, well, Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, as it's called today, Back in those days, it was called the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory. And uh, again, it was uh, a postdoc that really had nothing to do with the main mission of the laboratory, which uh, was, yet, say, let's say, radiation science. But uh, in any event, uh, uh, after that, I went to the University of uh, Tennessee uh, as a uh, young faculty member in physical chemistry. In the Department of Chemistry? In or? the Department of Chemistry yeah. uh, at... Uh, at uh, UT uh, Knoxville, that's right. right. And then? Well, uh, it was a uh, few years, and uh, I, I guess I, I, I always liked physical chemistry, but it always bothered me a little bit that uh, uh, I was laboring to do something that nobody really cared much about. And uh, a good friend of mine at the time, uh, Sig Lindenbaum, was at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And uh, I uh, worked summers at Oak Ridge, and I'd go out there about once a week. I had a small laboratory set up there. And uh, one day I came, and the SIG said, well, you won't see me next week. Uh, I'm going to be out interviewing for a job at the University of Kansas. He said, there's this fellow, Tak Higuchi, uh, who I guess is famous. And uh, he uh, is really starting up a, a program in pharmaceutical science. And, uh, well, I asked Sig, uh, what's pharmaceutical science? And he says, well, I don't know, but I expect <laughs> I'll be able to tell you when I get back. Well, he got back, he told me, he got the job, uh, and I decided that uh, pharmaceutical science might have been a pretty good place to practice physical chemistry where maybe somebody cares about the results. And, uh, I, well, I, I sent out a number of inquiries, and I went to work for Eli Lilly in Indianapolis. Uh, and changed in 1972 from uh, classical physical chemistry to, to pharmaceutical science. So what were you, what was the job you thought you were taking at Lilly? What was the, what, what were you going to be doing? <laughs> well, I mean, I didn't know for sure, uh, and, and, and they didn't either. Uh, but uh, I remember the interview, and I was asked a, a number of questions that were really testing, I think, whether I could think creatively uh, creatively and, and, and apply physical chemistry to pharmaceutical problems. And, and I guess I did okay, because they probably thought I could solve problems. And uh, I get there, and uh, one of the first uh, problems I was given uh, was uh, trying to understand and then solve the instability problem with nitroglycerin tablets. And uh, nitroglycerin tablets uh, at the time were, uh, were made uh, in a way, molded process, in a, made in a way which was uh, creating a rather strange instability result. Uh, uh, it, it appeared, uh, and in fact was the case, that uh, the uh, tablets would uh, come out of production with a content uniformity of about 5%, uh, but over time, storage over time, uh, that uh, content uniformity figure would sort of go to pot, uh, and you'd get up around 15 or 20 percent. And it, the, the, basically, the, the tablets uh, were redistributing the nitroglycerin. Uh, the rich were getting richer, and the poor were getting poorer. 
and we were supposed to figure out why, which we did, uh, and it was a, a good exercise in physical chemistry because, uh, well, if, if nitroglycerin is spontaneously transferring in the container from one tablet to another, it must mean that for some reason the free energy was less in one tablet than in another. Uh, vapor pressure is a measure of free energy, so we devised a way to measure the vapor pressure in single tablets of nitroglycerin and established indeed that was happening and, well, arrived at a solution to the problem. Now, this was hardly a major product, uh, even at that time for Lilly, but it was an interesting exercise. So what was the group you were recruited into? What was it uh, called? It was called Pharmaceutical Research, and at that time at Lilly, uh, in the Product Development Division, there were roughly 100 uh, scientists, uh, well, I guess maybe, uh, maybe a third at the PhD level, the rest at... Uh, at the other levels uh, of uh, professional training. And uh, uh, one, one of the groups uh, was perennials. The other one was, well, basically solids. Uh, we, it, it was tablets and capsules. Uh, another one was liquid ointments. And uh, then there was the, uh, the, the pharmaceutical research uh, unit. And that uh, existed for, oh goodness, it was a little more than 10 years, maybe 12, 13 years. Uh, before they reorganized. Uh, uh, in those days, Lilly was relatively uh, predictable from one year to another. We, they didn't change things all that dramatically. But I had a number of colleagues there who were wonderful to work with, and uh, it, it, was, uh, it was a very good experience. So the, the individuals in the explosive uh, area used to get nitrate tolerance, and then they, when they went home on the weekend, they'd have had it. <coughs> Do you have enough nitrates? In the well, the, yeah, actually, in, in, uh, I wasn't supposed to do this, but, but uh, well, I, the nitroglycerin uh, instability uh, or lack of potency uh, was noticed actually first by patients, I, I, I yeah, guess, I, was what I was told. And uh, they're accustomed to getting a real headache when they take uh, a nitroglycerin tablet. And sometimes they weren't getting the headache. And, uh, well, I thought I'd try it, so I took a low dose, I think 0.3 milligram, and yeah, I got a heck of a headache. Uh, <laughs> so it, it was uh, a, a, at least a qualitative measure of, of, of potency, uh, which, uh, I, I, well, it was, I guess, a good thing that, uh, that it gave that side effect, because uh, some patients certainly were not getting a therapeutic dose. So you're, you're certainly well known for what you then went on to in terms of freeze drying yeah. and lyophilization. So give us uh, the background well, of how that all started. <clears throat> it, it was probably in the late 70s. Uh, Alan McKenzie, who remains to this day a good friend, uh, came by Lilly and gave us several absolutely fantastic lectures dealing with freeze drying. And uh, well, I thought that was some really really neat stuff. Very interesting. Again, a good application of physical chemistry to something more practical. Kind of a combination of, uh, of engineering and, and, and physical chemistry. And so uh, I, I kind of got interested in it. And then about that time, uh, we had uh, our resident expert in freeze drying who had a disagreement with management, and so he quit. And Almost coincident with that, we had a major problem in manufacturing with one of the products. And uh, as uh, Lilly's policy was, at least in those days when you had a problem, uh, you created a task force. And so we had a number of folks get together who were supposedly knowledgeable in freeze drying. And uh, <clears throat> now, of course, I wasn't. I, I had attended Alan's lectures, uh, and I thought I learned a fair amount there. <clears throat> But uh, no, no real practical experience in freeze drying. But uh, <clears throat> due to the nitroglycerin mm, uh, effort, uh, I had some experience with vacuum systems because we used the Knudsen diffusion technique, which is a vacuum technique, to measure the vapor pressure. So I knew how to turn on a vacuum pump. And so I was immediately selected as one of the experts. <laughs> and uh, so I sat around in the first meeting and we discussed the problem and I realized I really didn't know that much about freeze drying. But I also realized that nobody else did either at the table. So I started to do some experiments and get into freeze drying, and this was uh, the, the late 70s. And I've been doing freeze drying ever since. I've had a couple of 
diversions to other things, uh, some of it related to freeze drying, like the interest in uh, amorphous solids, stability uh, in, uh, well, in freeze dried proteins, again, amorphous solid stability issue. Uh, but uh, the, the freeze drying has been with me, uh, well, ever, ever since. And, and to this day, the research effort at Connecticut is, is mostly in freeze dry. Right. So, so you spent 24 years at Lilly, yep. according to what I looked up. And then tell me about what happened. How did you get to Connecticut? And well, I, 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 I enjoyed Lilly. It was a great opportunity. I enjoyed the people I worked with. Uh, but, uh, well, somebody asked me why I moved, and, and well, the, the kind of light answer is that, well, when you've been in a place long enough so you know how to run it better than it's being run, it's time to leave. Uh, and uh, the, the, the real reason, however, was that uh, I kind of wanted to go back to uh, an environment where I had student contact, where I could shift the research emphasis, well, shift the science emphasis. Um, from mostly development to mostly research. And even today, we do some development work for industry. But <clears throat> I also uh, served as an adjunct uh, faculty member at both uh, the University of Michigan and the University of Minnesota. So I had some contact with students, and I enjoyed that. So I was looking around uh, for uh, something, uh, you know, maybe to do academically. and. Uh, well, actually, I, I owe this connection to having a beer with Gene Fees. <coughs> I was uh, advising him uh, when we were drinking, not too much, but, but enough, uh, that uh, I was perhaps interested in, in going back to academia, but in pharmaceutical science this time. And uh, he told Davy Colonia at the University of Connecticut, who was the, uh, well, he was chair of the search committee. And so we got together and, well, in... August, late August, over Labor Day, actually, I guess it was, in 1996, I put my belongings in my camper van and headed off to Connecticut. My wife stayed uh, in Indiana because we had not yet sold the house. So we've been at Connecticut for about 18 and a half years. All right, so I, I did the calculation. You 24 years in industry, and if I take Tennessee and Connecticut, 23 and a half years now <laughs> in, in academia. Yeah. So you're almost 50-50. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So, uh, I mean, there's many people in industry that feel that, you know, they would like to go back in the academia, but it's difficult. Cause, uh, tell us about it, you know. Well, I, I think there are several difficulties, uh, but, but I, I think in, in pharmaceutical science, particularly in my area of pharmaceutical science, I think it's a little easier to go back than it would be, let's say, if you were in chemistry. Uh, in, in chemistry, if you were a physical chemist, working uh, in industry for a number of years, uh, it would be very difficult to break in academically. Uh, and it's, uh, to some extent, a lack of appreciation of the academicians of the quality of science that can be done in industry. Uh, and, and it's history. But <coughs> in the <coughs> pharmaceutical science area, uh, it, it's more of an applied science, at least much of what we do. Uh, certainly the area I have been working in is is more applied science than it is basic science, depending on how you want to make the definition. But uh, my definition is if you uh, are doing some science, uh, because if you, and ask, trying to answer some questions, <coughs> and if you get the answers, you know what to do with the answers, then that's applied uh, research. Uh, so anyway, uh, I, I think you have to, in industry, have some visibility on the outside. Uh, you, uh, if you do a great job for the company, uh, that's certainly appreciated by the company, and that's really your first mission. But on the other hand, uh, you do need to maintain some external visibility, some reputation outside the company. Uh, otherwise, uh, a, a, a university will be very afraid of, of, of taking the chance of bringing in this, this academic who might uh, focus on things that are useless. So I I've read some of your other interviews um, and uh, didn't fall asleep. So, uh, <laughs> well, uh, I usually talk fairly loud. So <laughs> anyway. No, read them. I read them. Oh, oh, oh OK. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> but one of, uh, and one of the things that I, you have addressed, and I'd like you to talk about here, because one of the problems for industry scientists coming back into academia is the funding situation. Yeah. 
and uh, you have addressed that in, in some of the things. Well, that, and I'd like to, I think you're in a unique position, but I but I'd like you to talk about what you've been able to do and how you've been able to fund your research. If you have uh, a lot of external visibility when you are in industry, that is, you publish. Now, I don't think any uh, academic institution expects you to have a publication record after you know, 24 years uh, like you would have had after 24 years uh, in academia. Right. But on the other hand, uh, if you've got a solid publication record and a, a good reputation on the outside, uh, you have recognition. And that means it's a whole lot easier to get your foot in the door uh, with funding organizations. And I'm not really talking about the traditional federal funding agencies right. like the NIH, the NSF, and so forth. Uh, I'm talking about industry primarily. Right. Right. Uh, but you know people in industry, the people in industry know you, and so it's a little bit easier. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, going in these days as a young assistant professor, into pharmaceutics uh, is, is exceedingly difficult. Well, uh, into any area of, of science in academia <laughs> is difficult. Funding uh, levels, uh, uh, well, funding percentages, let's say, uh, for the major uh, federal agencies are single digit, and, and that's it's very difficult. Uh, but I did know a lot of people. I was fortunate to come into Connecticut, where Pfizer was very close, and I knew people at Pfizer. and. Uh, we, we started out collaborating. Uh, I did so with several people there. And uh, there, there would be organizations that would, uh, in some cases, contact me as a consultant. And uh, I, actually, Baxter Healthcare uh, did that uh, early in my career at Connecticut. And uh, that evolved eventually into uh, a fair amount of financial support for a project. And most of the, most of the, projects we did for industry were relatively short term. They were maybe several years. Uh, so you, uh, you don't have uh, the opportunity to get a, an R01 and, uh, well, I'm going to be a little facetious here, rest on your laurels for five years. Uh, I know you really don't do that. <laughs> but you really, uh, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, you, uh, you, you, have to keep, you have to keep hustling. And uh, that's, that's, an, that's an effort that uh, most of us don't enjoy that much. Uh, I, I enjoy talking to people about science. I enjoy going out and giving presentations and, and listening to uh, good presentations, getting into good, I was going to say arguments, but discussions yeah. uh, w w with folks. Uh, but going out and trying to raise money isn't as much fun. But uh, what has also uh, benefited from uh, interaction with Pfizer and uh, what was it, five or six years ago now, uh, we, uh, we got an endowment from Pfizer, $2 million, and a 50 cents on the dollar match from the state of Connecticut to uh, create an endowed chair, uh, distinguished, uh, uh, I am currently distinguished uh, chair in pharmaceutical technology, something like that. Uh, but it's, uh, that's uh, uh, sort of a cushion financially, and I don't use it all to uh, further my own research program. There were some general things that we spend the money for, but, but that's, th that's, that's a real benefit. And of course, a young person just coming in it doesn't really have access to that right. sort of thing. So if you got the distinguished chair five years ago, that's the same year you were the AAPS distinguished that's pharmaceutical right. scientist. That's right, yes. And I, I just actually realized <laughs> that today when I was looking at my CV. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. In 2009, right, yeah. yeah. So how about students, Michael? You know, students coming into your lab, is there academic positions for them? Or what, well, what's going to happen to them? It's, it's, to some extent. However, most of the students who come into uh, our lab and, frankly, the program at, at UConn uh, end up going into industry. Uh, well, sometimes FDA or this sort of thing, but uh, not academic positions. I've had a few postdocs uh, go into academic positions, uh, all of them in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the job market uh, is, is, I guess, a whole lot better historically for people in pharmaceutics in industry. Uh, now, that's gotten a little tougher recently, of course, uh, in the past, well, really in almost the past decade, but the last four or five years in particular. Uh, but uh, they, they, find, they find generally good positions uh, in industry, not that they uh, don't have to work at finding the good positions, but they do. Uh, 
the academic physicians are fairly rare, and uh, that's partly because many uh, universities are reluctant to hire a young faculty member unless they can identify with the goals of NIH. And uh, well, typically in pharmaceutical technology, that's a difficult assignment. Uh, and uh, well, we do have some NIH grants, but 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 this is not the the uh, the lifeblood of of pharmaceutical technology. So how about the students that come in? Is there uh, is there a separate group that are doing the technology versus uh, pharmaceutics? And well, and not not really. I mean, we have. Uh, Students come to UConn, mostly, most of our graduate students come from either India or China. Uh, we have maybe a third uh, domestic students, but uh, the domestic students uh, have backgrounds not in pharmacy, uh, but in either chemistry, chemical engineering, and some biochemistry. Uh, it, it, in it, being in a chemist as an undergraduate has some advantages in our program because you're you're up in the math and the physical chemistry, uh, but they have to do some remedial work in, in, in pharmacy, basically. Yeah. And of course, the pharmacy students coming from, uh, from Asia, from uh, India and China, they, they're probably better prepared in, let's say, in physical science than their counterparts in the US. The, the US program is, is very, very much clinical, uh, has been for quite a few years, and consequently, we don't get hardly any students from uh, institutions in the U.S. where their first degree is in pharmacy. That's generally true elsewhere. But so let's go back to your first days at Lilly because you didn't know anything about drugs. No. And uh, but uh, now you're a pharmaceutical scientist and a, a professor and how'd you learn all your drugs? <laughs> well you learn it by uh, going to meetings uh, one of the first meetings we had with nitroglycerin tablets, I was sitting there listening to the discussions and they were talking about the friability of nitroglycerin tablets. Now, believe me, to a physical chemist, friability didn't have any translation at all. Uh, and I, I didn't know what it meant. But I was too embarrassed to ask. But after the meeting, I asked uh, Jim Conine uh, what this meant and he explained it to me. Well, that's how you learn initially is you you shouldn't be too embarrassed to ask when, when, the, when it arises. But right. nonetheless, uh, you ask, uh, you participate in meetings, you pick up things by, uh, well, basically just being there, uh, and you read. Uh, and, and, and as you read, as you get more experience, uh, you, uh, you do pick up. I, I think somebody like myself coming from a basic science <coughs> uh, is better equipped to handle fundamental science problems, but you don't hit the road running because you don't know the pharmaceutical science part. And that's why I think pharmaceutical science degree is, is a rather unique and a very useful degree because it has the combination of the pharmacy background and the physical science, biological science. So let's talk a little bit about association, you know, and, and activities and the importance of that in terms of your career and what you felt was you wanted to accomplish? And well, in terms of the people, uh, it would have to be, well, first of all, Sig Lindenbaum, who sort of acquainted me with uh, what pharmaceutical science is, and, and Pack himself, who uh, was, was very nice to me. Uh, he uh, we, I got invited out to Kansas uh, several times and started to go to the Higuchi Research Conferences, and, and that, was, that, was, that was fascinating. And I got to see uh, some of the movers and shakers in pharmaceutical science uh, argue with one another. <laughs> and, and there was a lot of that. Uh, I mean, it was discussion, okay, but, but spirited discussion. Yeah. And uh, that, that, was, that was great fun. And uh, Samuel Kowski uh, kind of took me under his wing initially. And uh, I remember it was one of the first meetings that I went to that we struck up a, a, a friendship. And he would introduce me to the movers and shakers in the field. And I met uh, a whole number of people uh, through Sam. And, uh, uh, and, and so they sort of uh, got me uh, acquainted with who was doing what. And uh, well, uh, it, it, it had a significant impact. I, I think certainly the people involved in your training, uh, you know, your, your PhD advisor, your postdoc advisor, 
they have uh, an impact certainly as well. But for me, the, the impact there was in physical chemistry. Uh, and, and the pharmaceutical science folks were, uh, in, at least in the first five or 10 years of my tenure at Lilly, uh, it, it really helped a whole lot. And then there was, a, there was an individual at Lilly, his name was Ralph Pfeiffer, who retired, uh, oh, I guess a few years before I did. Uh, he was uh, trained as a physical chemist, as a crystallographer. Uh, he was, a, he was a, a very good scientific mind. And he helped me a lot in, in understanding what was significant and understanding some of the, the Lilly culture, but, but even broader than that, the, the culture of industrial pharmaceutical science. How about association societies and stuff like that? And well, I mean, in the early days, I was probably 1972 or three. I went to my first uh, Academy of Pharmaceutical Science meeting. And uh, that was pretty interesting because uh, that was uh, an exposure to a lot of things that I didn't see necessarily in the job at, at Lilly. Uh, well, I'd only been there a year or two. Uh, but beyond that, uh, uh, the meetings were much smaller in those days, yeah. which maybe it's a disadvantage, but it's also an advantage yeah. <laughs> because you. Uh, you, you get to, to know everybody, and you end up going to a lot of talks that are outside of your major area of focus. And so it, it gives you a little bit of a, of a broadening uh, opportunity. And, uh, well, I, I guess in the years, now, when did you lead the charge to? 86. Four? Okay. 86. Yeah. yeah. And I remember that. So you, uh, <laughs> I, my membership number is 65. So I, it, it's, uh, I wasn't the first, but, but uh, in the I'm first the group. First. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, it, it uh, in all those years, I think I've missed two meetings. Uh, now this one I didn't come exactly in the beginning for various reasons, conflicts and schedules, but but nonetheless, uh, uh, they've been good meetings. Uh, and uh, I also like specialty meetings. And uh, we hold a conference on freeze drying uh, every two years. We alternate between sites in. Breckenridge, Colorado, and Garmisch Partenkirchen in the uh, in the Bavarian Alps. Uh, we like uh, two very nice well places. known freeze drying places. Don't we? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, now we hold the conferences not during ski season, it's too expensive, <laughs> but but uh, during uh, during the summer. Yeah. And we just had a meeting there uh, a few well about a month or so ago. Yeah. And uh, those meetings are very good. They're highly focused. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also like some of the protein uh, conferences that John Carpenter sponsors. Because again, very highly focused. You end up knowing the, most of the people there, and, and that's kind of nice. Uh, and One of uh, your uh, highly cited papers is with John. Is, was he a student? Or what? Carpenter? Yeah. No. No. Yeah. Uh, I first met John when we were at a freeze drying conference in near the FDA, and it was been about 1989, I, th I think. And I was sitting right next to him. And uh, their speaker uh, was up there talking about uh, uh, crystallization of trailose uh, during freeze drying and the implications for stability. And I remember uh, the individual was looking at uh, FTIR to assess whether there had been crystallization or not. I leaned over and I, I spoke to John, who was sitting right next to me. I, had, I didn't know him, but mm -hmm. I said, all you really have to do is polarize the light microscopy, and you can see if it's crystal. So we started to talk after that, and uh, now uh, we we've been friends for really a very long time since since then, really. And my middle daughter did her PhD with John ah, Carpenter okay. uh, on freeze drying protein changes. Okay. So that's really interesting. Let's talk about you know your family and uh, kids were in pharmaceutical sciences. Well, uh, it, it, we we had some in the pharmaceutical sciences. Uh, my oldest uh, daughter. Uh, my oldest child, uh, daughter, Mary, uh, currently works for Lilly. Uh, she's in project management now. Her husband uh, works for Lilly as well. He's an engineer in the perennials area, and uh, guess what? He uh, does freeze dry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my, my older son is uh, a, a faculty member in electrical engineering at the University of Wyoming. So it's, let's say, technically oriented, but, yeah. but not pharmaceutical science. And uh, Rob, uh, my younger son, uh, now he, he uh, biochemistry is an undergraduate, but he got a master's degree in pharmaceutics from Michigan. 
And I was very pleased that he was uh, studying uh, pharmaceutics. But then he decided to go to medical school. Now, that pleased his mother greatly, but it disappointed <laughs> me. <laughs> but nonetheless, he's a physician now. Yeah. And uh, Catherine uh, is, uh, well, a chemical engineer is an undergraduate and uh, PhD with, with John Carpenter. Uh -huh. And then uh, my youngest uh, went through Notre Dame as uh, bio, biology, biochemistry, and ended up uh, as an optometrist. So. They're all technically oriented, but uh, not necessarily all pharmaceutical sciences. Was there a lot of science talk at the the cow table and <laughs> dinner table? And well, the, yeah, and my, my kids would ask me a question. And uh, I had a reputation in my family, and probably elsewhere, uh, that I would answer it in far more detail than anybody could ever want. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah, there was some. And uh, of course, the, the children all did uh, science fair projects. This was expected and, in essence, demanded. Uh, and uh, one of my sons did a, a project on freeze drying uh, as a science fair project. Uh, Great. So, anyway. <laughs> so, what's your future? What, what are you going to be doing? What, what are well, you looking to do right now? Well, I, I'm going to continue doing pretty much what I am now. I would like, uh, I, I'm not really sure I'm going to retire, period. Uh, but I would like to go half time, and uh, we'll see if, if that happens in maybe a year or so. Uh, because I have, uh, well, five children scattered throughout the country and 14 grandchildren that I'd like to visit a little bit more. Uh, so I'd like to make my schedule a little simpler uh, and, let's say, more flexible. Uh, and, uh, well, I, I enjoy, uh, for the most part, I enjoy what I do. There aren't very many unpleasant things that I have to do. That's right. And most of them, I, I think, uh, are great fun. So I, I know you've already sort of implied this, but let's talk about it directly. Uh, you know, pharmaceutical science is still an excellent field for people going into today. In terms well, of I think future. it is, because yeah. now the industry is currently going through a difficult time. Uh, there are still jobs out there, uh, at least for people appropriately trained they aren't necessarily the jobs with big pharma that uh, what we saw in the first half or two-thirds of my career. Uh, a lot of small companies, uh, contract uh, development companies, uh, specialty companies uh, of various types, some of them biotech. And I consult for some companies where the number of, of pharmaceutical scientists uh, is, well, in some cases, single digits. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, they're very small companies. But, but those are different kinds of jobs. And, and frankly, there's some advantage uh, to those kinds of jobs. You certainly have visibility. Uh, and that, as long as you do well, uh, is a very positive thing. Uh, and I, I think historically, at least in pharmaceutics, uh, students have been able to get jobs much more easily in industry than in most other areas of science, including chemistry, and I think, for the most part, even chemical engineering. And, and so it's not quite as much of a, of, a, of a sure thing these days as it was maybe 10 years ago, but it's still not bad. If you, uh, if you keep looking and don't have severe geographical constraints, uh, you're, you're, you're going to find a suitable job. And, uh, and it, I think it, there's a lot of satisfaction in doing something that you find interesting and something that you find is going to have some impact on, on somebody other than yourself. Okay. Uh, and that, well, I mean, I guess physical chemistry could be that too. But again, I, 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 I'm much happier as a pharmaceutical scientist. Good. So the students you talked about, you know, your, your source of students now, mostly China and India, are, are are, are, do you see a difference? Are the Chinese students going back and the Indian students no, staying here? Or no, most just, of them stay here. Yeah. Uh, and uh, well, one example is Stuart Wang. He, uh, <coughs> he has he had a PhD in analytical chemistry from China. He did a postdoc in the chemistry department at UConn in biochemistry. And uh, he came into my office one day and he uh, wanted to uh, enroll in our PhD program. I said, well, Stuart, why don't you just take a postdoc? He said, no, no, I, I, I want to go through the PhD program. I want to go back to China as the, ex, as the 
as a national expert in freeze drying. So he was going back to China, and he didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, he's still in the U.S. He may go back at some point, but he's still in the U.S. And that was a few years ago now. So what we have found is typically uh, the students remained in the U.S. And I think some of the students who graduated from UConn uh, did go back to India, one or two of them. Uh, I, I didn't know them because they were there and graduated before I came. So there's a little bit of going back to the mother country, uh, but not a whole lot at this point. I think that may change, uh, but right now it's the, most of them still stay here. That's great. So Mike, this has been a pleasure. I want to thank you for spending the time with us and sharing your well, experience. Well, it's, 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 it's my pleasure. <laughs> Good to see you again. Thank you.